Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode, which is episode 162 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful, as ever, Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at something that I think is a really interesting topic, but then I think they're all interesting, Bob. Power dynamics within the therapy process, or maybe power dynamics within the therapy room. Oh, yes. But before I go on on that, I must tell the podcast users. Well, I don't have to, but I'm going to anyway. I've just booked two holidays. Whoa. One in late July and one in late August. And when I did it, because Steph, uh, it's just my wife, loves to, yeah, well, she loves traveling. Um, but I didn't think through enough because um, I, I, the first holiday is in Kos, which is a Greek island. Yeah. It's in late July, and I looked at the temperatures, and they were in late thirties. Ooh, high! So I booked our own swimming pool. Which Love was it! Look at you <laughs> spoiling your darling wife. <laughs> and then I booked another stupid. I mean, I don't know why I did it. I booked another holiday late August in Corfu, and I looked up the temperatures there, and it was the same. So. Anyway, so I'm going on a, these holidays and travels, and I'm not sure about power dynamics when I booked the bloody holidays, but anyway, <laughs> um, it was an interesting, that's what I did. And then, then I decided to go full hog and put, booked another holiday in December in the Canary Islands. But they're all see, hot places. See, Bob, I'm just going to say I'm the opposite. I've just booked a five-day retreat in Poland at the beginning of December, and the weather is the complete opposite. I'm all about cold exposure now. So wow. I'm going to be climbing up a mountain in the snow in just shorts and T-shirts oh, at the beginning oh. of December. But you do the most amazing things. I think every day you have a nice cold bath, don't you? Yep. Outside <laughs> under my gazebo. Oh, my God. Let's move on swiftly. <laughs> so this, <laughs> this video is called Power Dynamics Within the Therapy Process. OK, so this is my take on a lot of this stuff. So I would say most therapists, and I'd like your take on this. Uh, yep. Sorry. Most clients, um, when they come to therapy, they project onto the, ther the therapist almost a Father Christmas myth. Yes, and they give up their power in the in the service of or the desire that the therapist will fix them. Absolutely, the yeah. I'm broken, and you can fix me. <laughs> yeah, and that's the projection. That's the transference, and that. So in that, in that process at the beginning, because I think that's the unconscious desire. Yeah, that often brings these people to therapy. Then the power dynamics are firmly put into the hands of the therapist. Yeah. And that's a scary prospect as a therapist in the early days, I think. It was for me. Yeah, but you see, here's the next bit I want to say. Um, and that is, not only is it talked about in our training, not only is are you very sophisticated understanding these things, the really frightening thing, I think, is twofold. It's when the therapist doesn't realise this process yeah. and they take ownership of the projection and think they that they can do this problem. They can be like Father Christmas. Yeah. Or stroke and the therapist who hasn't resolved their narcissistic urges buys straight into the trap. Yeah, that is a scary thing. That's scary, isn't it? Yeah. See, because for me, I don't see that any of my clients are broken. That's the first thing. Do you know what I mean? They've been through issues, but I don't believe that a human being can be broken. No, I think but you see, not yeah. be in a very good place. <laughs> okay. I, I am with you exactly. However, so having said that, we're both on the same ballpark. Yeah. However, the desire of most clients. And the projection of most clients put onto therapists is a Santa Claus myth. Yeah. The therapist's job is to fix them. Yeah. Even if the therapist, you know, comes to the frame of reference you just talked about. Yeah. 
but then we went to the problem are we of um you know those are the power dynamics which are set up so then the next question is what does the therapist do they understand the power dynamics they understand what's put on them they all understand they also understand disappointment letting people down and all sorts of other things yeah um next question is as these power dynamics are set up where does the therapist go from there so i'm really looking i'm looking i know it's the people who watch me on youtube would see this but podcast users can't uh listening to this can't see me looking at jackie but i'm really saying over to you over to me yeah yeah in a sense what do they do next what does the therapist do now and that projection is so intense and so high and the power dynamics are so swayed in the um position of the client the therapist what happens next yeah for me i'm really keen on encouraging and creating that co-creative conversation between me and the client. And I'm really honest with my clients. Yeah, but let, let's take this a step further because you're a TA therapist. I train in TA, integrative psych, both settings, but we'll use TA. So what you're saying, if I'm going to follow this through. Yeah. That what's important for you is to develop an adult to adult conversation. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you're absolutely. prepared, so I'm going to follow this through, you're prepared to disappoint the young, good child, in the, well, it's 2A, child ego state, um, in the service of co-creation. Yes, in a nurturing way, let's say. I don't want to let them down completely and abandon them in, in that, but yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's play devil's advocate for you then. <clears throat> Another way of doing therapy, and I'm I'm not saying there's a right and wrong here, but if thinking developmentally about, you know, object constancy, about internalized positive parents, about building up a robust relationship, about helping a relationship with a client which is built on trust, continuity, and predictability, so you can do the regressive work, isn't it also a way you could go? Is to to promote the um, this relationship that we just talked about that where the therapist takes on the projection and is the idealised ether. In other words, the, the client projects onto the therapist the father Christmas process yeah. and makes the therapist an ideal yeah. idealised other. Yeah. If you... Right, the reason to... Well, you might have some positive memory rather than go perhaps the co-created adult to adult way I've just talked about. Is if the client can keep the idealized parent, i.e. the therapist, yeah, then the therapist will have a better template for regression because the positive trust and everything else have been handed over to the therapist to enable the um, therapist to be more powerful than the toxic parent they already have in their head. Yeah, I can so see that. I'm not saying we go that way. I don't want you yeah. to hear that. Yeah, I'm yeah. Just talking about if the therapist thinks clinically rather than this narcissistic perhaps way, with, but understands the reasoning for it all, then maybe the co-created discussion you're talking about could happen much later. Yes, yeah. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's an interesting discussion. Absolutely, yeah. I think one of the fundamental things that I refer to, for me personally, and I refer to it and talk to my clients about it, is the OK Corral, I'm OK, you're OK. And that, for me, is really important in the therapy room. Mm that I haven't got all the answers. Do you know what I mean? We work through this together. Oh. And I get what you're saying, that that can come across and be quite anxiety provoking for some clients that, excuse my French, but shit, I thought I was coming here because you would know what to do. And I'm openly saying, I don't have the answers. 
Do you think timing? Absolutely. Has a lot yeah. To do with this? yeah. 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 So, you can say, so I don't know. Would you say that in the first half an hour then? No. No. And the other side of it in the OK Corral is I'm not OK, you're not OK. And for clients, I think often they're coming to the session in a not OK position. <laughs> you know, so it's really important for me then to let them know that it's a safe, secure environment. If I come into that, maybe as a, you know, a, a new psychotherapist showing them that I don't feel OK in this situation either, that's not a good place to be. <laughs> So, so what you're talking about here is comes from TA, the Eric Burns idea of four existential positions. Yeah. They're psychological positions. They're not real positions. They're psychological positions. I'm okay. You are okay. Psychologically. Yeah. yeah. They're four existential positions. I'm okay. You are not okay. I'm not okay. You are okay. And I'm not okay. And you're not okay. So we have four life positions and they're psychological positions. Yes. And they provide a really good moral compass, which I understand. Um, I mean, Eric Byrne, also the originator of transaction analysis, one of the reasons he veered away from psychoanalysis, because he was in psychoanalysis for 17 years or something, with Eric Erickson and uh, Paul Fredern in the 40s and 30s. Um, why he veered away and created transaction analysis is because he, he wanted his new model, if you want, to um, come from the place you've just said and a adult to adult framework rather than all the power dynamics being in the hands of the analyst yeah. who made two or three interpretations from this power position. Um, so that's psychoanalysis. So I can, I can hear you, I hear your, your, your thinking. See, I find that really, really hard to accept, Bob. The, you know, that power dynamic, because I know for me, you know, I'm a human being and sometimes life throws me curveballs. And, you know, sometimes my interpretation of situations might not be always the best, dependent on what's going on in my world. So for a, a therapist to, to have that control in the the therapy room i feel i'm feel really uncomfortable with that you know my state so you, of mind isn't necessarily yeah. always in the best place yeah. so you were trained in 2007 was it no 2012 to 2016 2012. yeah and you also trained in um transaction analysis and developmental transaction analysis but if we go back to you know the birth psychologist, psychology and psychoanalysis with Freud and Jung and people like that, they came from the frame I was just talking about um, at the beginning of this podcast. And that is that the analyst needs to have be the up, up dog, if you like, yeah, of the yeah. dynamics in order, in order that, that their interpretations through regression are more powerful than the psychotic, disturbed, parental interjects, interjects of yeah. the other. Yeah. Right? That's what I was saying to you. But the problem with psychoanalysis, there's lots of problems, by the way, but anyway, <laughs> one of them is that the, and Freud particularly, until later on in his life, um, didn't talk about the analysis of counter-transference. In other words, the therapists were all um, omnipotent, and they there was not an ex there was not an examination of their own human yeah. abilities yeah. and their, their dark past themselves. So, so it wasn't until much later in the literature where um, you know analysis of the therapists themselves became well written about and prevalent yeah and that's the problem i think that when you have no analysis of the omnipotent analyst or stroke therapist the power dynamic is too intense in one way yeah absolutely and that's that's yeah 
I, I'm just pleased that things have progressed on from from that time. They have, and I mean, we had the birth of psychotherapy, and then yeah. different types of psychotherapy, and relational psychotherapy became very popular in the end of the, you know, the other uh, century. And now we have the, the idea of self objects and many other things. And I think relational psychotherapy has become much more popular. And also, what you're talking about in this co-created adult to adult relationship with the with the cloud being effective for psychotherapy. So that's all there, what you're talking about. I still think that though one of the central problems that has been addressed, so for example, therapists now have to have, if they're members of the UKCP, have to have a lot of analysis of their own issues, which makes the power dynamics much more likely to be equal rather than top dog, lower dog. That's there. But we also have, say, the BAC, for example, at another level completely, which don't, um, they don't, it's not like the counselors, et cetera, et cetera, have to have analysis of their own personal issues. Yeah. Therapists in the UKCP training do 160 hours, but on the BAC counseling world, yeah. now, a lot of, a lot of counsellors, of course, do then, you know, look at, but you don't have to. It's not yeah. in, not a dictate from the BAC. So I, I think some of these issues lie when counsellors and therapists haven't looked at their own dark sides and they stay fixed in the viewpoint somewhere, though maybe not even therapists and counsellors, perhaps not even voiced that they're there to where you started off with. Uh, they see the other person coming from an, you know, they're okay and the other person isn't, basically. Yeah. Yeah, because, you, if, you know, there's a danger, I think, if you go into that other phase of I'm okay, you're not okay, as in, you know, I've got all the answers and you don't, is that the client then builds up an attachment to you and that they're only okay because they're seeing you once a week or once a fortnight or whatever it is. And that if ever mm. that's broken, then mm. they're going to go back to an I'm not okay place. Mm. Absolutely correct. And leads to infantilization. Yeah. Find young. Yeah. It just doesn't feel ethical to me. I don't, I don't know. I I love the transactional analysis way of co-creating something and just exploring things and. Oh, I don't think it is. Educative ethical. stuff. Yeah. I, 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 I completely agree with you. I don't think it's, uh, comes from a particularly ethical standpoint of uh, practitioners who come from a place of infant, infantilizing their clients. So the clients don't in inverted commas grow up and become dependent on the therapist for thinking and everything else that goes with it. Yeah. I don't think it's ethical. Yeah. And for me as well, if I was on the receiving end of it, I think it would be quite disempowering <laughs> for me. Mm. Yeah. Well, absolutely it would. It would become very, very difficult. So the power dynamics in psychoanalysis all these centuries ago was definitely coming from an up dog, down dog, or down posi up position, down position, where the analyst was the interpretator of reality and the client was the on the, on the other end of that. And um, today, I think it's very important to look at and reflect on uh, how dynamics being played out in the psychotherapy process. Yeah. And as you're talking, Bob, I'm thinking about how things can be interpreted or misinterpreted or the parent-child relationship type thing. Because, you know, having said all of that, I'm quite firm with my boundaries in the therapy room which could be seen as quite parental or something I don't know I'm just thinking out loud <laughs> you know like start times and finish times and appointments and contacting me outside of it I am quite you know firm with my boundaries does that mean that I'm in a one-up position I don't know I think you're modeling 
a part, you know, um, positive structure, positive boundaries. Um, you know, in TA they talk about the, the importance of structure hunger. Yeah. And without these boundaries and structures, often the client um, will feel neglected. They will feel um, unsafe. They won't feel there's a container for them to bring their anxieties and aspects to because the boundaries end up being lax, uh, moving, and not secure. Yeah. So I actually think it's what I would say absolutely pivotal to have positive boundaries and a, a structure that both client and the therapist know. Yeah. I, I do, and I'm not saying it's not up for negotiation, do you know what I mean? But there still has to be a structure there <laughs> around things, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was just as you were speaking, I was thinking then, does that, yeah, how does that fit into all of this? Well, if you didn't have that, the problem is that I don't think you'd provide a secure environment for yeah. clients to feel safe in, especially the youngest part of the client in TA language. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you didn't provide that safe structure. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I just love the, these conversations that we have, Bob, because I'm constantly reflecting on what I do in my therapy room and, yeah, what that means and how that pans out and things. Well, your job, your job, I believe, is to provide an environment and a structure where specifically the young part of the self in terms of the client, what they need to do, feel safe. Yeah. So yeah. I see that as part of the job. And I, I, I hear I hear what you're reflecting on, that that might be interpreted somewhere, you know, that you, you have all the power. But as long as you keep the co-created, flexible discussions, you know, in the between the two of you, then I think it's absolutely great, by the way. Good, because that's how, that's how great, I run my therapy room. <laughs> yeah, I think it's essential. I don't know how work can be effective if there isn't a positive structure and a, a safe contained place for people to work within yeah that's that's part of your duty of care towards the client is what i see and then of course by modeling that you also um help them internalize safe secure boundaries in their own psychological process yeah yeah. And I think it's healthy to be reflective on on how we are, you know, personally and professionally as well. Absolutely. The other thing, power dynamics do change depending on the therapy that you're doing. But the important thing, I think, is that um, if you're going to do aggressive work where perhaps more of the power might be in the therapist's hands, for example, in terms of you're working with the development of young relational deficits. That's done from an adult to adult, to adult contract. Yes, yes, yeah. Because there is a, a, a power dynamic shift mm. in a therapeutic sense in that way, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. I think it's really, really important. Eric Burner is the originator of TA called Contractual Theory at the heart of his new transaction analysis mainly because he really believed that the contact should be co-created through the adult-adult relationship rather than a one-up, one-down power dynamic of the psychoanalysts. And I really like that bedrock for effective... Um, I was, if you, you're looking at the, you know, the history and how everything was set up back then, that was a really brave move for somebody to come in and say, actually... I don't like the way that this is done. I think it should be done where we're, I'm okay, you're okay. It was very courageous for the time. Yeah. Because psychoanalysis in 19, you know, in the 50s, 40s, uh, and T, this new model was formed in 1958, 57. Um, the book Transaction Analysis came out in 1961. But in those times, psychoanalysis um, was still very you know, prevalent. Uh, a lot of the new psychotherapies like Gestalt psychotherapy and many other 
of the new psychotherapies uh, were starting to come through, the psychoanalysis was still quite a, a force. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think... And I would imagine they didn't want change to happen, <laughs> that they were quite happy with the way that it was set up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Eric Byrne was a pioneer in that sense and a very ethical practitioner, I think. Yeah, yeah. Fair play to him. I'm glad that he was. <laughs> so I think reflecting on power dynamics and taking any doubts or reflections that you have around changing power dynamics and what it all means to supervision yeah, um, is the way forward. Yeah. And again, in that power dynamic thing, and it going back to the previous podcast that we did, you know, I would imagine that sometimes it does trigger, do you know what I mean, where we are in our own relationships, if that makes sense. You know, that parent-child relationship, do you know what I mean? If we feel like the therapist is telling us what we should do, as opposed to exploring things, that can be quite triggering for a pair, for a client in a, a session. Yeah, of course. I, I think contracts are so important. Yeah. I mean, everyone talked about therapy contracts should, you know, at the beginning of therapy, uh, whether they're overall contracts or sessional contracts, should come from an adult to adult position. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's so important, I think, in what we're talking about here. And and if we lose sight of the adult to adult con contracts, then I think through, through basically the agent of transference, um, power dynamics may shift in an un in a unhealthy way. Yeah. Yeah. Again, Bob, another brilliant podcast episode something I could talk about a lot and I think a lot of the mistakes therapists make and a lot of the ethical problems that therapists often find themselves in is because they haven't reflected on the changing power dynamics and what it means clinically um, in the therapy process yeah and they haven't used supervision enough to have a sort of like meta perspective eye on their therapy process yeah there's something for me as well you know again as you're talking there that I was coming up about the, the client taking responsibility in the therapy room or in therapy do you know what I mean mm. I think if there's a power dynamic it, it's kind of like they're not taking responsibility for what happens in that therapy room they're just a passenger <laughs> well I like what you said in the contract making and about co-creative discussions. Yeah. I'm okay, you're okay position before you actually perhaps do the therapy because um, then you are from the beginning evoking um, adult thinking rather than infantilization. So I really like that. And, uh, and if you are going to work with the relational needs and the unmet deficits of a younger place where a lot of the trauma comes from, by the way, yeah, I think if that's done with a contract that is adult to adult, it provides for effective ethical practice. Yeah, which is what we all want. Well, I think it's so important not for the, not only for the um, therapy profession and the the, the the class and the healthiness of all that, um, but for a. Uh, for the recognition of good practice by uh, the therapist and the reputation um, is so important here because if you go down the path of unethicalness where you have a, what I think the power dynamics get stuck in a one up one down place um, which may lead to infantilization and not effective psychotherapy it's um, it's not a good place it's not no. a good place for our profession either no well, thank you, Bob, for that. Mm, you're welcome. I enjoyed talking about. Um, Do you want to know what wonderful title you've given us for the next one? I'd love to know because often I give you all these titles, uh, say 50 at a time, whatever it is. And then later, as we go through them, I actually forget what I said in the first place or what those 50 titles were as we work through them. So what, what have you got down? 
This is an amazing one, I think. It's the Dr. Spock profile in therapy. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. That's a great one. What's I sometimes one? wonder where your head is when you're coming up with these titles, <laughs> Bob. I love that one. Yeah, what's the other one then? Um, and then after that, turning down the negative messages in our head. I like that one, Bob. Yeah, so they're, yeah. they're, really, two, they're really two good ones. That, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing both, to speak about both those subjects. Yeah, me too. Right, until next time, Bob, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.